Hi everyone, this is Caitlin Snyder with the National Housing Conference. I can see lots of people are dialing into the webinar. We're just gonna give it about two more minutes before we get started, so just sit tight. All right, folks, we're going to go ahead and get started. As I said, my name is Caitlin Snyder, and I am a policy and research associate here at the National Housing Conference. We've got a really great presentation for you today from Alan Malik with the Center for Community Progress on his new report, his recent report, The Empty House Next Door. Um, before we dive into that, I wanted to touch base on a policy update that I want to make sure everyone was aware of. So the Federal Housing Finance Agency recently issued a proposed rule the Federal Home Loan Bank Housing Goals Amendment. So this would update their 2010 regulation on housing goals for the Federal Home Loan Bank. Um, it does a couple of things. One of the major things is that it removes the $2.5 billion threshold in order for banks to have the um, housing goals applied to them. In the past eight years, they've only applied three times. So removing this threshold would mean that it would apply to all 11 banks each year. It also does a couple of different things around um, their acquired member asset purchases. It sets a 20% um, goal for all acquired member asset purchases have to be for low-income families or families in low-income areas. And then it also sets a 50% um, small member participation housing goal um, so that small institutions can have access to this kind of capital. So I don't wanna dive too much into the rule because there's a lot there and we could spend a lot of time on there. I did wanna let folks know that tomorrow at 2 p.m. the Federal Housing Finance Agency is hosting a webinar on its new rule. So I encourage people to dial into that to get a sense of the rule. Comments on this rule are due on January 31st of next year. Um, so you've got some time to kind of work through the rule and work through your comments, but it is something that's important for folks in this community and this housing and community development space. It's a good source of capital that I wanna make sure that folks are paying attention to. And the next thing, um, I wanted to announce our Solutions for Affordable Housing Conference on November 27th and 28th. On November 27th, we'll be covering topics like GSC reform, Community Reinvestment Act modernization, fair housing at 50, and some other topics. We're offering folks on this webinar a 10% discount, so you can register and use code SAVE10. This does expire tomorrow, so make sure you um, register soon if you are hoping to attend this. And then on the 28th, we're also gonna be holding our first um, advocacy day on the Hill, so we're really excited about that and offer attendees a chance to interface with their members of Congress and their members of Congress elect. Of course, the, the big news in DC is the 
elections, but I'm sure everyone has seen the news on that, so we won't spend time here getting into that. But this advocacy day will be a good chance for folks to get to know their new members of Congress since they'll be in town setting up their offices um, and also to get some last minute legislation through this lame duck. So before I turn it over to Ellen, I did wanna mention that we'll be taking questions at the end of the webinar. So if you have any questions, please type them in the question box in your GoToWebinar module throughout the webinar. And this webinar will also be recorded and we'll be making slides available and the recording available within a day or two of the presentation. So with that, I'm going to introduce Alan and turn it over to him. So Alan, take it away. Okay. Thank you, Caitlin. And let's see if I've got this. So good morning, everybody, or afternoon, depending on what time zone you're calling in from. And I'm going to apologize in advance. I've got a bit of a cold. So if you hear the occasional sniffle, don't take it too seriously. So I'm going to be talking today about vacancy and abandonment in the United States. And just FYI, this is based on a report that came out created by the Center for Community Progress and the Lincoln Institute of Land Policy earlier this year. And I believe you have access to a copy of this report. And obviously what I talk about today will only cover, you know, small bits. So I certainly urge all of you to take a look at it. So to begin, let's talk a little bit about vacancy period. And it means a lot of different things. It means houses that are being offered for sale, being offered for rent, houses that are kept in seasonal occupancy, and as well as a category that the Census Bureau uses, and I'll come back to this in a bit, which is called other vacant, which is a catch-all for houses that don't fit into any of these categories. And at least in older cities and many rural areas, is something of a rough equivalent of houses and apartments and buildings that have been abandoned. Now, most vacant properties are not abandoned. And in fact, vacancy is a critically important part of making a housing market work. But a lot are, and they come in different styles and sizes. And most of the information that is available is on residential vacancies. Those are the things that are most readily counted. But there are huge numbers of commercial and industrial vacancies, and particularly in cities that have seen population loss, sometimes by now over many decades, like Detroit or St. Louis or Philadelphia, you have large numbers of vacant lots, which are, can only be counted really by people going out and actually doing so. Now, when we think about vacancies, you know, a key issue is looking at the vacancy rate and what it means. And this, this chart shows how vacancy rates have shifted in the United States over the years. And it also gives a pretty good handle on what seems to be a normal vacancy rate when you don't have either a bubble as we had in the early years of the millennium or a recession. And it seems pretty clear that for you know, owner-occupied housing, the vacancy rate is somewhere around 1.5 to 2%, and for rental housing, probably around 7 to 8%. So if we put that together, we can come up with a kind of a rough typology, because bearing in mind that in any market, you're going to have a mix of ownership and rental. So the sweet spot, if you will, is an overall vacancy rate typically in the four to eight percent range. If it's under four percent, you're likely to have a tight housing market, which is going to provide, a, impose a lot of constraints on people looking for housing choices. But as it gets above eight percent, it starts to get progressively looser until you get into a category, and I'm going to come back to this because this is particularly important for distressed urban areas, which I've dubbed hypervacancy. And hypervacancy, and as a rough rule of thumb, this is when the overall vacancy rate is, say, above 20%, is a point at which, in many respects, the housing market is now 
dominated by vacant properties and can no longer function properly. So just briefly to touch upon why properties are abandoned. I mean, there are a lot of different reasons and every property, as somebody once said, has its own story. But the dominant reason is simply weak market conditions and lack of demand. If there's too much supply and not enough demand, houses are going to be abandoned. But I think what's particularly important from a policy and practice standpoint is bad laws, policies, and practices like tax foreclosure laws or mortgage foreclosure laws that encourage vacancy or encourage properties to end up in limbo and so forth can easily make the problem much worse than it has to be on the basis of the market issues alone. And conversely, good practices can sometimes reduce vacancies below what the market might otherwise make possible. Now, also, just to bear in mind, and I don't have to belabor this because I think most people intuitively get this, abandoned properties, that is properties that are not only vacant but neglected, are a huge problem for the communities where they're located. There's been a lot of research that shows that they can reduce the value of the properties around them, sometimes by as much as 20%, that they tend to be magnets of illegal activity or public health problems. They reduce confidence in the neighborhood, they reduce tax revenues, and obviously they can cost local governments huge amounts of money in terms of police, fire, code enforcement, and ultimately, in many cases, the cost of demolishing the properties. So to look at some numbers for a second, what this chart shows, which I think is quite interesting, is that predictably enough, as the foreclosure crisis and the recession hit, vacancies skyrocketed and went from nine and a half million properties to units rather to just over 12 million by 2010. Then as the economy got better and the effects of the foreclosure crisis diminished, they started to drop. But what's a concern, and I think this is something that's still going on, is that having dropped to about 11 million, they've pretty much stayed there since 2012. And so even though the economy has been continuing to grow, vacancies still remain at a significantly higher level than before the foreclosure crisis. The other thing is worth noting, and this goes back to, this is the distribution of that other vacant category, which are the units that are not being offered for sale or for rent or for seasonal or temporary use. And what this kind of shows very vividly is that the largest concentrations of these properties are not necessarily in urban areas and certainly not in the coastal areas, but it, in many respects, rural areas. And what's quite interesting is that on the whole, Vacancy rates are higher, are highest in rural areas in the United States, and particularly in the Deep South, in Appalachia, and in the Great Plains states. But turning back to urban areas, though, what's noticeable is that vacancy rates predictably vary enormously from one type of city to the next. And here, what I did is here is I took a cluster of cities in four categories. Magnet cities are the cities like Seattle or Washington that are drawing huge amounts of in-migration and investment. Sunbelt cities are cities like Phoenix, Miami, Las Vegas, which took a disproportionate hit during the foreclosure crisis, but have since recovered quite dramatically. Legacy cities, for those of you who might not be familiar with the term, 
is a term that's come into use to describe the older industrial cities of the country, many, probably most of which, have lost population since their heyday in the 50s or 60s. And the large cities are those over 200,000, like Cleveland or St. Louis or Pittsburgh. The small cities are cities like Trenton, New Jersey, or Dayton, Ohio, which are under 200,000. So what you can see is there is a pretty clear gradient here in terms of as you get from the magnet to the Sun Belt to the legacy cities, vacancies go up. And that at least with respect to the cluster of cities I looked at, the problem tends to be more severe in the small cities rather than in the large cities. And even though this isn't statistical proof, because as I said, it was just a handful of cities, I think this is generally valid because the small cities, again, places like Dayton or Flint or Youngstown or Trenton, are having a lot of difficulty matching larger cities like Pittsburgh or St. Louis or Baltimore in terms of revival and revitalization. Mainly, they lack the global universities or medical institutions. They lack the critical mass that seems to be feeding revival in those the larger cities. So they have a more severe problem. Now, by contrast, in the magnet cities, even during the recession, vacancy rates kept going down as people kept moving into these cities and investment kept following. Legacy cities, vacancy rates have stayed high before, during, and after the recession. But in the Sun Belt cities, you can see they went up and then back down again. Because in many respects, contrary to what some planners and writers said at the time, the recession did not signal a significant shift of population away from cities like Las Vegas or Phoenix or so forth. It was basically a hiccup, a big hiccup, but nonetheless, it was a temporary phenomenon. But when we turn back to the legacy cities, the older industrial cities, these are the cities which have hyper vacancy as a central and critical issue. So if you look at these two maps, they show Baltimore and Cleveland and the census tracts which, in which 20% or more of the housing units are vacant. As you can see, this covers close to a third of Baltimore's census tracts and well over half of those in Cleveland. So this is a major issue. These are areas, again, where vacant properties basically dominate the housing market. And it's important to remember, when we talk about 20% or more being vacant using the census data, that just refers to struck units in buildings. But as you can see from this map, a lot of these cities have huge inventories of vacant lots generally created by the process that's been going on since the 50s of demolishing empty and substandard properties. So almost half of all the parcels in the city of Gary, Indiana are vacant. Almost a third of those in Detroit. That's over 100,000 separate parcels of vacant land in the city of Detroit. And so if you assume that these are going to be disproportionately in the areas that also had the vacant structures, you're typically looking at areas where anything from 30 to over 50 percent of all of the properties or separate parcels in a neighborhood are va either vacant buildings or vacant land. And that is hyper vacancy. And here, as you can see, this is Baltimore again. You can see that this is an increasing phenomenon. Baltimore, in many respects, is, has been a very successful city in the last 10, 15 years. The, they've seen a lot of 
you know, young people, educated young people move in. They're, they've seen fairly significant job growth. They've seen some neighborhood revitalization. A lot of dramatic things have happened. And yet, at the same time, hypervacancy has become a far more significant problem in Baltimore than it was, say, back in 1990, when it was limited to a handful of census tracts. And this reflects the fact that as the population continues to shrink, and as the revival tends to be concentrated in quite small areas within these cities, large parts of the cities are continuing to decline. <clears throat> so with that as background, I'd like to shift to the question of, okay, what do we do about this? And the fact is this is a critical challenge for any city which has distressed low-income neighborhoods or for that matter any you know suburban township or rural area of similar character because as i indicated before these properties have a significant negative impact on their surroundings both socially fiscally and psychologically. And so there are three themes that I'd like to talk about. First is rebuilding housing markets, second focusing on demolition, and third on greening. And I think it's important to point out that ultimately for a strategy to be successful, it has to be designed to reflect not just the condition of the building, but the reality of the neighborhood context. So there are many neighborhoods, like the one pictured on the right here, where vacancy is pervasive. There are more vacant lots and vacant buildings than there are occupied properties. On the other hand, there are other neighborhoods, like the one on the left, which are still basically intact neighborhoods with a fabric in place. They're, they're neighborhoods, not just prairies, if you will. And yet, for a variety of reasons, vacant abandoned properties like the one circled are starting to pop up on what are otherwise still intact, viable city blocks. So what will work in one place will not work in the other. And realistically, the prospects, especially for rebuilding housing markets, are a lot stronger in the type of neighborhood described on the left than the one on the right. On the other hand, some of the strategies like greening are particularly appropriate for the latter. So when it comes to rebuilding markets, I think there are a number of key issues. The first one is simply removing obstacles to getting properties reused. And the obstacles can be numerous. They can be legal obstacles, such as a tax foreclosure law that puts properties into limbo indefinitely, or they can be the fact that people who are basically irresponsible, perhaps people who don't live anywhere near the community, are sitting on large numbers of properties and the city lacks tools to be able to get the properties back into use. It can be the lack of capital for people who would be willing to invest in properties but can't get loans or mortgages. It could be the condition of the properties themselves and the fact that they cost more to rehabilitate than the market will permit and need a gap subsidy. So there are a lot of obstacles and you have to analyze which ones apply in which neighborhoods or to which properties and then figure out how to remove those obstacles. A second strategy which is Oops, sorry, I was 
which is a, an increasingly used tool to address vacant properties, is the idea of land banking and creating dedicated entities, which can be either within city government or increasingly sort of quasi-governmental corporations or authorities in at the county or local level with the mission of getting control of vacant properties, maintaining them, and figuring out how to put them back into use. And since the first state land banking law was passed about 15 years ago in Michigan, there are now over a dozen states that have laws that authorize creation of such agencies. And they're probably as in the area of 150 independent land banking agencies around the country. And this can be very valuable because again, in the typical course of local government, people have a lot of different agendas and a lot of different priorities. The beauty of a land bank agency, especially when it's given the tools to get control of properties and adequate resources to do the job, is it is a single focus agency that can address this issue directly. And then finally, strategies to build markets, whether it's a question of marketing a neighborhood, whether it's ways to get houses back into use. So the in the image, there's an organization in Youngstown, Ohio, that fixes up vacant houses. It's very selective about which ones it does. It fixes them up and then sells them to home buyers. And when they discovered that home buyers were having trouble getting mortgages, they raised the money to create a mortgage program. So where necessary, they not only rehab the house, but provide the mortgage to the home buyer. So there are a lot of different strategies that can be used, but again, it's critical that these all be in the context of neighborhood conditions. The second issue is about demolition. And demolition is a tough issue because a lot of people have understandably problems seeing houses, many of which could be rehabilitated, demolished. But the crux of the problem is that in an area that has a significant surplus of houses, very often it just may not be possible to preserve all the houses that in theory could be rehabilitated and reused because there may be nobody there to actually reuse it or certainly not enough people for all the houses. And the cost of mothballing a house and keeping it from being vandalized or destroyed or undermined during over many years in the hopes that there will be a market in the future is often unrealistic. But the challenge for local governments and CDCs and planners is to come up with effective strategies to be able to determine when to demolish and when to preserve housing rather than simply do it on an ad hoc basis. And the third area which flows logically from the first two is that no matter how good you are at building a market, in any city where there is again a significant surplus of housing and buildings relative to the demand, as properties are demolished, vacant lots are the result. And these lots are not going to see development anytime in the foreseeable future. 100,000 plus vacant lots in Detroit are not going to see new houses built on them in the immediate or even the near future. So what becomes particularly important is to have uses for these properties that will sustain them over time without involving the development of new houses or office buildings or shopping centers. And what has really emerged as a major approach in city after city is the cluster of activities that are characterized as greening. 
strategies for using vacant land, whether it's for community gardens, mini parks, rain gardens, other trails, and other forms of open space that become community assets rather than community problems. And a number of cities, and the picture, the lower picture is an illustration, have actually created very good pattern books for community groups that might be interested in adopting a lot that show all of the different things that can be done with vacant land, how much it costs, what your materials, how much time, and so forth you use. So for people who are interested in this, both in Detroit and in Baltimore, they have excellent packet books, pattern books rather, and the, the one illustrated comes from a website called Working With Lots, which has been created by Detroit Future City and is well worth looking at. Another strategy I'll mention briefly that is being increasingly used because almost every older city has a significant environmental problem in terms of combined sewer overflow, which is what happens when you have combined storm and sanitary sewers and you have a large storm and end up releasing untreated or partly treated effluent into a lake or a river. And this is a major issue and for the last, oh gosh, at least 10, 15 years, EPA has been putting pressure on cities to stop this problem, which is a major source of pollution. And one thing cities have found is that you can use vacant land properly designed, properly contoured to as a way of diverting stormwater from the sewer system and letting it run off into the groundwater. And growing number of cities have in fact submitted plans to EPA to help address their problems in this fashion and are now doing so. Philadelphia really pioneered this probably about 10 years ago with the first such plan, which is now well underway, but many other cities are doing this. So to wrap it up, I'd like to talk about a few key strategies going forward. The first one is very simple, know the territory. A lot of cities really have no idea how many vacant properties they have, what their condition is, and where they are. And one of the things that is being increasingly done by cities and towns is to do actual parcel surveys of the community to get a handle on what's there. And with the technology that allows people to walk or drive down a street with a handheld device where they can enter the information, take a picture, and have it go in real time into a database. This has become both feasible and not very expensive, and it is an utterly invaluable tool for any city or community or CDC that is serious about trying to tackle the vacancy problem. The second, look at the legal issues in the community, which are often a function of state law rather than local ordinances that are acting as barriers to effective action and explore how those laws and ordinances and policies can be changed in order to make action feasible. So one of the most important ones are the laws governing tax foreclosure, for example. And in many states, these send properties into a kind of limbo where they can sit literally for years and years vacant and abandoned with nobody taking responsibility for them. In other cases, it's a question of the absence of a law or ordinance that is important in terms of taking proactive steps, such as a good law governing receivership, where a city or a CDC can go into court 
and get the court to give it control of a vacant property so it can be rehabilitated. So it's important to look at the laws, find the obstacles, but also see whether a particular city may not be using tools that state law gives it. Third, capital access is critically important. It is hard for people to get mortgages on low value properties in distressed areas. It is hard for contractors to get loans. It is hard for people to get enough money to be able to fix up their properties or fix up vacant properties. Having strategies at the local level, working with banks, working with CDFIs, state HFAs, et cetera, to ensure that there is a flow of capital that can be used to restore and maintain properties and to increase home ownership in order to revitalize some of the neighborhoods that are slipping is critically important. And then finally, it's important to think strategically about vacant properties. And to remember, a vacant property does not exist in isolation. It exists in a neighborhood context where how that vacant property is dealt with can affect the neighborhood, but what the dynamics of the neighborhood are affects the property. And I'll give one example because I think it's important and it's illustrative. The city of Baltimore developed, starting back in 2010, an exceptionally effective strategy for getting vacant properties put back to use. And it's a program called Vacants to Value, and there's a fair amount written about it, so I won't go into the details. But basically, they were getting vacant properties reused in large numbers. Since 2010, they have gotten, and again, this is with very little public money involved, somewhere between two and 3,000 houses and small multifamily buildings put back into occupancy, use, and back on the tax rolls. Well, but if we look neighborhood by neighborhood, there's a very interesting phenomenon. In some neighborhoods, if you look from 2000 to 2017, say, they rehabbed a lot of properties, and as a result, the number of vacant properties in that neighborhood went way down. Other neighborhoods, over the same period, they also rehabilitated a lot of properties, but the total number of vacant properties in that neighborhood actually went up. So what does this say? Basically, in, this, in the second category of neighborhoods, they were getting properties rehabilitated, but properties were still being abandoned at a pace that was even faster than the pace of rehabilitation, and so the overall numbers got worse. doesn't mean they shouldn't have rehabilitated those properties because things would have been even worse without it. But what it is saying is rehabilitating those properties didn't change the basic factors that were leading people to abandon properties in that neighborhood. So even as they were rehabilitating them, more properties were being abandoned. In the other neighborhoods where the vacant properties were much more a central factor in the neighborhood's problems, as they rehabilitated the properties, the numbers went down. So the moral of that story is that you really have to see this in a larger context. Whether it's rehab, demolition, or greening, these are tools. And the vacant properties, for all of the seriousness of the problems they create, are fundamentally symptoms rather than the causes of an underlying neighborhood trajectory. And any truly effective, sustainable strategy has to look very broadly at what is driving the neighborhood's decline and how can the city, CDCs, and other stakeholders develop strategies to change that trajectory 
and put the neighborhood on a sound path. Thank you. Thank you, Alan. That was a really great presentation. I want to remind folks that they can submit questions through the question box. Um, we have one right now, so I will turn it over to David to ask his question. I just wanted to thank you, Alan, for joining the call. It's David Dworkin, president of NHC. And uh, and also just thank you for your really uh, incredible work over the many, many years on this issue and how incredibly helpful you were to me um, at the Treasury Department. And um, it's really uh, um, great to see so much continuing research in this important area. I, I'd like to ask, um, as you look at cities like Detroit, um, what do you take away in terms of the next steps to um, really turn the corner uh, where there's been success? And um, now that the um, we're getting towards the end of the TARP money for blight removal, um, what do you think of the major national policy um, initiatives that are needed um, to um, really deal with this issue going forward? Well, well, thank you, David. That is a good question or questions. Okay, first about Detroit. I think what, if you look at Detroit in a kind of a very broad way, you know, they, there's sort of like three distinct types of area. There's a relatively small area, and if you think of this as downtown, midtown, and some of the neighborhoods nearby, that is clearly moving forward in a very strong way. And you've got a lot of investment going forward. And I think there, in some respects, the role of government really should be how to facilitate the investment that's taking place, but otherwise stay out of its way. In other words, you know, if there are key properties that need government intervention to be acquired or put into a package or something, it should do that. But it shouldn't really, it should really defer. The second category is really critical. It's sort of the neighborhoods in between. The neighbor, and you know, contrary to what a lot of people might believe when you read about Detroit from the outside, Detroit is not all boarded up houses and vacant lots. There are large neighborhoods, large parts of Detroit that are still basically functioning but struggling neighborhoods, especially in the Northwest and Northeast of the city. And there, I think it is critically important. And that's where rebuilding markets and addressing those scattered vacant properties that are popping up on, the, on individual blocks making sure people have access to capital, making sure houses are in good shape so that people can buy them and so forth are critically important. And that's where I think the Detroit Land Bank has started to do a pretty decent job in trying to flag some of these issues. But there are a lot of neighborhoods in Detroit that are probably still salvageable, but are still far from secure or stable. And then the third category are the neighborhoods or areas which are indeed mostly vacant. And there I think it's going to take a while before the opportunity for rebuilding markets in those areas is really going to exist. But there are still a lot of people who live in those neighborhoods. And I think the critical function, and this again is primarily a public sector function, but with a lot of involvement from community groups, CDCs, and so forth, is to ensure that these neighborhoods have a basically decent quality of life, which means that they're healthy, safe, and clean at a reasonable level. And when it comes to vacant properties, again, that calls for demolishing properties that can't clearly be saved. It calls for greening vacant lots in ways that turn those properties into assets. And 
perhaps down the road, depending on what happens to the regional economy and the global economy and everything else, demand will build in Detroit to where you actually can go back into some of these neighborhoods and start redeveloping. But in the meantime, I think the focus really has to be on quality of life. Now on the second question, what should, I think clearly government has a critical role and equally clearly, a city like Detroit does not have the resources to do everything that they ought to do or would like to do. Because I think, you know, you currently you have a pretty capable city government <clears throat> in place at this point with a lot of ambitious ideas of what they would like to do. And I think coming up with some federal programs that really facilitate integrated, effective neighborhood revitalization and rebuilding strategies, I think would, to my mind, would be the ideal goal. I think another piece, and this goes well beyond vacant houses, but it actually has a relationship, is the need to create a universal housing allowance of some sort. So we get away from the model we have now where housing vouchers are essentially a lottery where a few lucky people get them and most people don't. And the reason I think this relates to vacancy is that the, the inability of poor and near poor people to afford the housing, even the most basic housing, without paying 50, 60, 70% of their income is not only the cause of most of the evictions and insecurity that those families and their children experience, but is also the cause of a lot of neighborhood instability and a lot of abandonment where you have landlords who simply just are walking away from their properties right and left. So I think if we're going to stabilize our neighborhoods, we may have to start by stabilizing our low-income housing market, which is currently extraordinarily unstable with extraordinarily negative consequences for everybody. Thank you. So we had a question come in, does a high rate of homelessness correlate with the incidence of hypervacancy? Actually, probably inversely. I mean, I think it's not entirely clear what high rates of homelessness correspond with. I mean, some of the highest rates of homelessness, I think understandably, are in places like Seattle or San Francisco, where in effect, it's all but impossible to find housing that's remotely affordable for somebody, a struggling poor person, except through some kind of government program or housing subsidy program. But I think you find homelessness everywhere to varying degrees, because again, especially family homelessness is a function above all of housing insecurity. And ironically, even, you know, there's a theory that, you know, if there's so much vacancy, why don't rent, rents come down to the point where poor people, you know, who could only afford maybe 200 or $250 a month can find apartments at that level? Well, it doesn't work that way. It's not like cars where the values and the prices keep coming down and down and down and down. Any landlord who wants to at least break even has to charge a certain minimum amount of rent to cover his or her basic maintenance costs, taxes, and a return on whatever they paid on the property. And in most cases, that's you know, six or seven hundred dollars a month, even at the most minimal level. And so the upshot is that even in areas with hyper vacancy, where there are units going begging, you still have 
high levels, probably not as high as in the you know, really expensive places like Seattle or San Francisco, but you still have high levels of homelessness because, again, there is a basic structural gap between what poor people can pay for housing and what it costs. Thanks for that. Um, we have another question. In the last points, you mentioned that there was greater success in reducing the abandonment rate when the targeted efforts focused on those abandoned housing units that were central to the abandonment problem. Mm -hmm. That sounds like the key was tying efforts to code enforcement, going after just individual houses in otherwise stable neighborhoods. And then they go on to ask, is that strategy feasible in neighborhoods with hyper vacancy? Yes and no. It depends on, it depends on a couple of other factors. One thing that's really interesting is that the neighborhoods where Baltimore's strategy was most effective in terms of actually reducing the number of vacant properties overall were neighborhoods where you had high rates of vacancy and in some cases hyper vacancy, but they were close to some kind of major asset or center of strength or an existing strong neighborhood. So location played a really critical role in determining success. And I can imagine, you know, if you have a neighborhood that may have hyper vacancy, but it's, it's located, say, close to downtown or on a light rail line or in the shadow of a major university or something, that neighborhood is going to be in a very different position from the standpoint of what's potentially feasible in rebuilding its market than a neighborhood that has the same vacancy rate but is located four or five miles away. We had one more question about um, finding funding to address some of these issues, and she asked specifically besides looking at our local budget. Well, Funds are a constant problem, but I think one thing that's worth thinking about is some cities do use their local budget funds, local general fund money to address vacant properties. I think it's worth exploring whether you can convince state government to provide funds in this area. I think clearly, I think this is something the federal government should be involved in, but I think that's a long, slow battle. But I think looking at state government, and a few states have in fact provided funds for demolition. I think another thing is something like the greening strategies are not necessarily hugely expensive. You can do a lot to an individual lot for a thousand or fifteen hundred dollars, and if you can mobilize a fair amount of community energy, that can help. The other thing, I think, in a lot of cases, it may not be a matter of funding so much as coming up with a strategy that accesses private money. So, for example, Baltimore's program was based on the proposition that if they could create a highly predictable pipeline of properties for small developers and contractors, both for-profit and non-profit, that there were many neighborhoods in the city where the contractors and developers would be willing to spend their own money rehabbing those properties because they now knew that they could get as many properties as they wanted at an affordable price in a timely fashion with clear and marketable title to rehabilitate. And they, the city was fairly selective about the neighborhoods where it ran this program, but they included probably half or more of the city's neighborhoods. And that basically motivated people to rehabilitate these properties. They had a large pool of contractors and small developers who wanted to do this. So 
that model is something that could be done with very little federal or state or even local government money. Another approach, and I seem to have lost my train of thought here for a moment, but I think there, there are other ways as well that, for example, if you can enlist, in many cases, as I indicated, you may not need a subsidy for something, but you need capital. So if you can, again, put together some kind of a partnership with perhaps the state HFA, banks, CDFIs, and so forth, to get access to capital at reasonable terms, you might be able to make some significant impacts. So I think you really have to be just as creative and opportunistic as you possibly can. And But in the end, I think one of the real issues is that demolition is something that, as a general proposition, there's no alternative to just having money where you can write a check and don't have to expect it to be paid back. And that is that is difficult because, as David mentioned earlier, you know, the federal program, the hardest hit fund monies are gradually being used up. There's no new major resource for demolition in the offing. So I think that's going to be a huge challenge. If I were a city, though, I would be looking to perhaps try to form some kind of a coalition of other similar cities and try to convince the state to come up with some kind of a demolition front fund, perhaps even a demolition bond issue. I think that's a great idea. Um, speaking of being creative, I wanted to make sure folks were aware of the Center for Community Progress's report. They issued the Creative Placemaking Report. We did a webinar on it last month, so it's available on our YouTube channel. I encourage folks to check it out and read the report. Um, so with the few minutes that we have left, um, I'm hoping that you can just kind of walk through for folks who aren't as familiar with the Center for Community Progress and kind of what it is that you guys do around land banking and how to be helpful okay. in this work. Okay. Okay. Well, first, the Center for Community Progress, we're, and we're about, I think, either nine or ten years old. It's a relatively small organization, which was created initially to focus on the problems of vacant properties in the United States and to be a resource for communities trying to take these properties and turn them into positive assets. And land banks are one of the tools that we encourage. They're not the only one, but they're one, and we're kind of identified with the land banking movement to some extent. And as, but over time, we've actually become quite involved in broader issues because we recognize that, again, a vacant property does not exist in isolation. So we've been looking at issues of problem rental property, which is in many cities as serious a problem as the vacant properties, and overall questions of neighborhood change, neighborhood stabilization, and so forth. So basically, we work with people to help address the physical environment problems of cities, starting with, but not limited to, vacant problems. And we do a lot of training programs. We do a lot of hands-on technical assistance. We publish a lot of what I would consider are extremely useful and interesting materials. And I urge everyone to check out our website. And we have a major national conference every roughly 18 months. The next one is going to be in the fall of 2019 in Atlanta, which are a great opportunity for people to really learn new ideas, new directions, new strategies in dealing with problem properties and struggling neighborhoods. Well, thank you. And I can confirm that it's not just author's bias, that their work really is interesting. And Alan is also the author of The Divided City, which I highly recommend that everyone in this who's interested in this area check out. But um, we are at 
three o'clock, so I'm going to end our webinar. And I just want to say thank you so much to all of our attendees for joining the webinar. And thank you so much to Alan for sharing your great knowledge and insight into this area. And thank you for doing this work. Well, um, thank you. So I hope everyone has a great rest of your day. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.